So let's get started. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. If this is uh, your first time uh, doing anything with Taller Puerto Riqueño, we are a cultural center in Philadelphia, um, servicing the Puerto Rican and Latino community in North Philadelphia, which is, uh, for those of you that don't know, um, the poorest area in, as you know, one of the poorest cities in the country. But um, Taller is, you know, has been in operation for 45 years and uh, with, um, in the realm of things, been very successful in promoting and growing over the years. Uh, Unfortunately, this, uh, these times are very challenging and very difficult. And rather than having you visit our beautiful new building, uh, we need to do this uh, on the internet. So welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, and we're really happy that we are able to do this even, even under these circumstances and, and continue to, to do the work that is so critical in the arts and culture Mm -hmm. that hopefully create a fabric for, you know, in a way, in a, in a path to at least keep us sane while we get out of this uh, <laughs> craziness. Um, I'd like to, you know, give you a little bit of in instruction on, on how we envision that this is going to, um, to evolve uh, during the afternoon. Um, the... We're going to keep everybody on, on mute because, of course, that prevents, you know, echo and um, accessory noise um, and, and, uh, and helps us uh, hear, hear each other. Um, there's a chat uh, feature on Zoom that uh, you can use to ask questions uh, during the first part of the program. Uh, Graciela is going to be uh, managing that. Graciela Vasquez is uh, the manager of our store and the manager of the Meet the Author series. Um, and, uh, you know, she's, she's here and she's going to manage that part of the, um, of the program right now. And then uh, on the second half, she's going to moderate the, the question and answer session. Um, <clears throat> as has been mentioned in the in the promotion and as, as we um, have let, um, have agreed on all of the proceeds of any books that you purchase are going to go to support uh, the situation in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the, the reality is that in, in a way similar to what's happening um, all over the world, right? The problem, you know, starts with two storms or whatever, and then earthquakes, and then, you know, um, COVID, and, you know, and now there's the dust uh, coming from, the dust storms coming from the Sahara in a, in a political situation that is very challenging. So um, I think it's important that, that we all, um, as Latinos and, and, uh, and Puerto Ricans, uh, help each other and connect to each other. And, and this, um, this anthology, does that it, it um, you know it's a new compilation of Puerto Rican writers um, unique for because of those circumstances um, Elena was a graduate student when in September of 2017 the those two hurricanes uh, hit Puerto Rico back to back um, the second one which hit the island barely two weeks later ransacked the island and and claimed over 4,000 lives. And like so many of us in the diaspora, Elena, Elena, you know, watched the, the, the horror and the devastation and tried to figure out what to do about it or how to help. Mm -hmm. So she decided to work on this, uh, on this book that works out of the national pride and solidarity um, as a way to, to raise uh, money for <laughs> to help, you know, originally it was to help uh, the storm recovery, then, you know, the earthquake recovery, now, you know, it's COVID, now it's, you know, it's Sahara, the, the island is, is in such a, um, a difficult um, moment in its history. Um, 
So um, doing this, um, like we've uh, done in, in, in all kinds of different uh, capacities, raising money, sending money. Um, Lourdes Hernandez is here from Pico. We even purchased lambs and sent them to Puerto Rico. So we all in some capacity or another have tried to help in different ways. Um, so then um, I'm gonna, you know, use that as an introduction and I'm gonna introduce um, Elena Aponte, who is the, the editor of the anthology. Elena holds a bachelor's degree in creative writing and a master's in literary and textual studies. Um, she's convinced that uh, her Puerto Rican and Irish heritage is responsible for her love of all things witty and greedy. Her creative work in fiction and poetry has appeared in a number of publications and anthologies, Barrel House, Chip Pop, and Matchbook Literature. Her nonfiction has appeared in Anime Feminist and Women Write About Comics. She hails from Toledo, Ohio, and has been a pet care worker, a bookmobile driver, and a Justice Center librarian. Currently, she's a writing and women's studies instructor at Bowling Green uh, State University. And without more ado, um, let's uh, welcome her with a silent <laughs> applause. Hi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, Elena, it's wonderful to have you, and we're we're you know honored and and touched uh, that that you're here. I also want to recognize the other um, two participants of of the of, of the afternoon, Teresa Mendes Quickly, who actually should take credit for connecting all of us so that this event could happen and move forward. Um, and Anne Cardinal. So, Elena. Okay. Take um, it on. Thank you. Um, so, I can talk a little bit about how this project sort of started. I mean, um, Carmen mentioned that a little earlier, um, but I was, um, the idea came immediately like two years ago in March after um, the Harvard, Harvard posted a um, research thing that they had done about the death toll that was miscounted from the hurricane and it had you know exceeded everyone's expectations unfortunately um and so you know knowing that um especially with the way i was frustrated with the way that the current administration was um providing or not providing aid to puerto rico so i was like i want to do more than just donate you know fifty dollars hundred dollars i want to do something um that really speaks to a lot of different people, but also tells people about Puerto Rico itself. So, and I was like, I don't know what else to do other than, you know, I'm not a doctor, an electrician or anything like that, but I can, I can write and I love writing and poetry and things like that. So um, I thought, well, hey, maybe I could start this anthology. Um, so it was a really small idea. I wasn't even sure if I was gonna be able to do it. And, um, I reached out to my one of my professors at BGSU. She her name's Abigail Cloud. Um, she's the editor of Mid American Review, so they have a literary journal attached to the university. And I was in her um, desktop publishing class that I think my last semester there or the semester before. And um, I reached out to her and talked about the project, and she was like, "Yeah, let's do it. That sounds awesome." So I think to have her enthusiasm also was super great. <laughs> um, if I hadn't had her like help, obviously this would have been extremely difficult um, because you know I'm I'm pretty okay with editing with selecting things, but when it comes to actually putting you know like text together, right? It's kind of difficult, and I needed Abby for that. <laughs> so I am beyond. I owe her like my firstborn child essentially. Um, but we put out a call for submissions and. She helped me connect to a few groups on Facebook for that and like new pages and things like that. So like the literary um, social media, she really helped me find a lot of that. And then on Twitter, I had a lot of literary friends um, and writers who were on just connected to different journals. And so um, through that little grassroots network, we were able to get like over probably maybe 300 submissions or something like that, um, which was a lot. And at first nobody, kind of showed up, we just had them trickle in. And then so by like August, I was like, nobody's gonna send me anything. Um, but then by the end of uh, September, we had, um, let's, 
I don't know, we had like a bunch of people show up all at once. Um, because at that point, things had really kind of snowballed on social media and stuff. Um, and people were really curious about it. And that was what I was very, very happy with. They were like, sure, let's do this. How can I do this? Um, recently, one of our contributors, his name is um, JL Torres. He wrote an article about um, this anthology. And he compared it to Roberto Santiago's previous anthology of Puerto Rican writing. Um, and you know he claims that there's no other anthology like this since Roberto's, um, and I had no idea. Um, I had kind of assumed maybe that there was, <laughs> but I guess this one is the first one to be collected in 25 years. So that um, that kind of blew me away. I wasn't really uh, expecting that to actually be a thing. <laughs> um, but anyway, my my. Going off of that, what's really important to me about this is that it's not just poetry, it's not just, you know, academic, dense academic language or anything like that. Um, there's a lot of like real world stuff in here from um, told from a Puerto Rican perspective. So that's kind of what I always wanted for this project was like, you know, Puerto Ricans from every corner of the world. Um, actually talking about this. You know, we had submissions from France, we had submissions from California, we had submissions from um, Australia. So, you know, a lot of people were interested globally in this and that really excited me too. Um, I think I was so excited to, um, because I had read Anne Davila Cardinal's book, um, Five Midnights, and I reached out to her on Twitter asking her, like, would you be able to do an introduction for this? And like, she said yes, like immediately. <laughs> I was so excited. So that that really lends. I'm honored. So. Yes, no, I'm honored as well. Um, that really lended some credibility for this as well, um, because Abby, and again, it wouldn't have happened without Abby, Abby Cloud. She was like, you know, just reach out to to one of your authors that you're interested in on Twitter. And I'm like, can I do that? Is that what I'm supposed to do? <laughs> um, but I did and it worked. And I think that that's truly like, this kind of thing is, is what social media is made for. This kind of technology, that's really what we should use it for. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of, of everybody that's in here. Um, and I'm really proud that there are some contributors here that are that are participating in this not only is reading, but there's some here as well that are watching. So Beatrice and, and Leslie are here as well, which is really cool. Hi guys, it's nice to meet you in person, sort of. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, it was just really cool. And I'm, I'm really honored and it looks awesome. I wanted to kind of avoid that sort of, um, kind of, um, how should I describe it politely? Uh, that, that sort of look where you can tell, okay, that's self-published, right? It does look very professional. It looks really cool. And I think that you'd want to pick this up at a bookstore. So um, yeah, I hope that answers some questions about the origins of the book. Um, I can talk briefly about the song or the title if I have time. Do I have time for that? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not sure where I first heard the song or the song mentioned, but um, after the hurricane, a lot of people were um, protesting and things like that. And there, it came up when I was like looking at, um, I think it was the Chicago Puerto Rican parade. So like the, one of the first Puerto Rican parades that came on after the hurricane and people were singing this song and quoting it. And I was like, oh my God, I've never heard of this before. Um, and the line that really stuck out to me would be like, I'd be Puerto Rican even if I was born on the moon. So it's this notion that like, no matter where you are, like you're Puerto Rican, whether that means you're half a Rican or a quarter Rican or like a whole Puerto Rican or you're born on the island. Like we all have this common family and this common ancestry and that's like really important to me. So I thought that that should be reflected in what you're looking at immediately too. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, and if, yeah, if you have questions about any of that stuff, please, please, you can put them in the chat or you can ask me later after the end. Um, I do want to say too, like for Teresa's poems, which you'll hear today, um, I chose to open 
the anthology with those because I thought um, the most iconic thing about Puerto Rico, one of them, is the coqui. And her poems dealt a lot with the coqui frog in the beginning. Um, and I thought that was just a really nice way to like to open the anthology. So to have the coqui kind of song taking you into the island and then then her other poems go into sort of the history of the island as well. So I thought it was a really nice way to open the whole anthology. Um, and I remember when we were um, communicating over email, like Teresa was so excited. <laughs> like I get to open the whole thing. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, the best part of this project has just been like meeting everybody and talking to the people who are in the book and um, people who've read the book. So. Yeah, it's been great. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say yet, I don't think, <laughs> unless you have questions. Go ahead then and introduce Teresa. Absolutely, I can introduce Teresa. Um, she is a really awesome person. <laughs> and um, like I was saying, her poems really touched me because I thought that they were very, um, personal. They were very, they had a very personal touch and they dealt a lot with the traditions of Puerto Rico. Um, I can give you a little bit of her uh, CV bio here. So she was selected for the Montgomery County Poet Laureate in 2004, Philadelphia. Um, she received Judges Award by Mad Poet Society in 2001. Um, her work has appeared in Not What I Was Expecting Anthology. Um, Philadelphia Stories, Philadelphia Poets, California Quarterly, Fule Festa, and many others. So without further ado, please welcome Teresa Mendez quickly. Thank you, everybody. And um, first, thanks to Elena and her team uh, for not only selecting um, and publishing my work, but also creating this anthology, uh, knowing that this is such an, like, a unique experience to have an anthology of Puerto Rican voices is um, pretty uh, um, moving and um, and also makes it, I mean, I was um, honored and, and thrilled to have my work selected, but to be part of an anthology that is very unique um, and it's only happened one other time is pretty um, uh, humbling. So thank you for doing that. And also I wanted to thank Taller Puerto Riqueña for creating an artistic venue in Philadelphia. Um, and especially to, to Carmen and her team because um, I remember when Taller was just like, like a little room on Gerard Avenue. And then it became uh, a row home, um, our, our Fifth and Lehigh, and now it's this beautiful center where it has an amazing bookstore. So, um, and it has all these different amazing opportunities for artists and for children to learn creative expression and to be able to have a place like this um, is truly amazing. And it's, I encourage people when we get a chance to go out again and when Taller can open again to really experience that place because it is um, a beautiful modern venue. Um, so thank you. And, um, as Elena said, this is a bargain because you can't go to any bookstore and get a book for $10, really. And now you're, this is $10 for a lot of work. And um, there were a lot of voices here and a lot of images um, that uh, are worth the, the, um, the, the cost for the book. So thank you. And thank you all for joining us on this lovely Saturday afternoon. So the first three poems I'm going to read um, appeared in the anthology. Um, so, and they do deal with, uh, uh, they're based in Puerto Rico and, um, and they're true. So um, the first one is the coqui. The coqui is a, is a tree frog that is native to Puerto Rico. And in each of my poems, of these poems, there's that double meaning. So be on the lookout for that. And there are some words that will be in Spanish in some of the first three poems that I will read today. The first one is Night of the Coqui. One, each call is a warning, each key a lore. Coqui, 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 come dusk, coqui, coqui, until dawn. Two, the silence of morning is discerned, 
the koki dozes in the diurnal curl of leaf. Three, the hush by day marks the approximation of nighttime. Four, the koki sings and he is going to sing. Five, up close on the palm lamplight, the striped male refuses to surrender his melody. Six, the river bears the Gokis shadow. The one does not beckon the other. Seven, the self calling goes on. All night, the calling to each other goes on. It goes on every night so that no one has ever heard a silent night. The next poem that I'll read is called 1918 Conscription. And conscription is a term that was used um, for World War I and is basically what we call the draft today for males to um, be taken, to be drafted and sent to war. And in 1917, the Jones Act was imposed in Puerto Rico and that made us um, U.S. citizens. It also meant that our men were able to be drafted into World War I. So it's called 1918 Conscription for Tio Juanito. They say every day she cried out your name into the trees, across the montañas to the cielos that mocked her in blue serenity. Did you curse the new day that brought with it no release? For an entire year, your family didn't know where you were. Your mother had asked you to walk to town a half day's journey to buy supplies for the farm. When you reached the plaza, walk by what used to be a coffee distribution office en route to the almacén, the officer out front asked your name. You were arrested. So what, you were a peasant farmer's son far removed from newspapers, the radio, or even a map of the European front. Upon release, the enlisting officer forced you to register. Is there in that untenable X standing in for a signature? All you knew was that you had been expected to return home with cords to te tether the goats, string for wrapping pasteles in banana leaves, a sharpened machete. 12 months later, the labored walk home, paso a paso, your arms empty. The next poem is called Second Great Lesson. So after World War I, a few years later, the US military government imposed English as the instruction for school, even though most of the teachers didn't speak English. So it's called um, Second Grade Lesson. By the time mother had started school, instruction had begun in English so that abuelo started to keep the kids away from the schoolhouse. Those foreign words corrupting home life. I imagine mommy paying attention in her bare feet, interlaced fingers, wanting to learn the word for snow that never fell in the tropics, intrigued by the teacher who had once let ice crystals dissolve on her New York touched tongue as each child in the class mimicked a snow. So I'm gonna um, switch gears a little bit and do some of my other poems for the uh, next few minutes. Um, uh, this poem, next poem is called What Cannot Be Extinguished and it was published in the Schuylkill Valley Journal which is a local um, uh, uh, publication. 
that does a lot of poetry and prose. So what cannot be extinguished? This time of year, the light nudges the night, stretches the daytime from an early easterly sunrise through to the fold away of morning glories. When Hephaestus gave man the gift to make fire over sticks and stones, flickering more powerfully than the stars, no one could predict what was to come. Men gathered at what would have been the close of day, darkness shoved back, and, and with it came the dangers of storytelling, igniting ideas, the spark of rebellion and greed, the rise of nations from the ashes. Multitudes. I want a letter that knows what it wants to call itself, that makes the same sound over and again without compromise, one that doesn't acquiesce to bullies like T and R, that refuses to end in silence like B. Give me a non-consonant that can vocalize in soliloquies, make musings on other sounds filled with intermittent sonority. A vow that brightens bold, risks being seen naked, running across the page unafraid of midnight hours. One that is more than an utterance. I like O, oh, the way, it, <coughs> excuse me, I like O, oh, the way it coos and rounds out the mouth with pleasures. O, oh, the oasis among alphabets, the progenitor of all things indigo. Oh, even as an aging raindrop teetering on the end of a winter branch before its final collapse bursts into multitudes of O. Oh. Many of you know this is the year of the census. And so while doing um, some family history for uh, my, my spouse, um, I ran across information about his great-grandmother, his Irish, Elena, his Irish great-grandmother. This is called 1900 Census Head of Household, Margaret Sharkey, 34. There's no mention of William the toddler who died before the last count. No foreshadowing of Leona's TB at 15 that would take her the following year. Gone will be little Margaret, her namesake. All that's listed, told in numerals. Ages, number of residents, year of ed years of education, and a W for widow. Where does, where does all that sorrow go to be counted? So the next three poems deal with um, being a mom and, um, and being a mother, mother, you learn a lot about yourself and also about your child. So this one is called Motherhood, Winter 2013. When we used to have winters. <laughs> um, the tears tumble over rounded flushed cheeks and vault off the chin more well up in reddened blue eyes that look up at me. His fingers have darkened to pink, mine ache from the cold. His voice qu quivers, I don't want my gloves. His anguish is as real as the nightly monster in his room he has named Nina. Eclipse was published by U.S. Worksheets um, and starts at three and a half. My son looks up at the late afternoon sky from where we are sitting on chairs on the driveway to listen to birds calm him down, give me a break from a long day. Mom, the sun is going down. Uh-huh. I agree as I look over at the gold finches atop purple cone flowers. In a few months, 
there would no longer grace the garden, make the stalks sway. My son continues, in another part the world is going up. I side glance him, no longer keen on the birds or the echinacea. Oh yeah, like where? I half expect him to say China, if anything. Instead, he says Indonesia. It dawns on me that already he is smarter than I am, knows of a world, wider world beyond this one I've created here in the safety of Longfield Road. His shadow stretches over me. The sun sinks into the horizon to start someone's new day. Notes from my son. My son is forming stick figures with round heads on lined paper. It reminds me of Pittman, the shorthand I learned all of 10th grade. His look like those peas I repeated row after row, page after page. I can't recall most of it now, just a few scribbles I never applied. My son puts down his pencil and picks up his sticks, drowns out the music. He names the patterns, tizzes, paradiddles, rolls, triplets, accents, slam. I've underestimated his doodles, how he makes sense of this expanding world. One day his melodies will depart too, our home booming with silence. Another census poem, what the census cannot count. So many words for being left behind, for surviving the deaths of others. On the gray sheets, you can glance widower, glimpse widow, spot orphan. But there is no word for having lost a child, for a grieving mother, a father's muted loss. No written page can ever tally such sorrow's weight. So I'm gonna be reading, I think like two more poems. I just wanna give an alert for those of you who have children listening. Um, even though it's pretty clean, it might spark some conversation. Just letting you know. Mexican restaurant, North Jersey. Had they different names or had this not been her first job stateside or had the guy just ordered instead of insisting his knowledge of typical Hispanic names, perhaps then his three friends at the table wouldn't have fallen on top of each other and the Mexican-American manager standing next to her wouldn't have doubled over in uproarious laughter while the two of them stayed silent, she not understanding, he much chagrin. But her name was Ingrid, fair with sandy brown hair, her accent exposed her Colombian origin. Yes, this is my name. Flirting, he shook his head and continued to resist. No, it can't be. Years later, when Ingrid was at, was at dinner in Kansas for a conference with a group of us, she related the incident and she still was not fully knowing why the 10 of us lit up the diner with guffaws and tears. What is your name? She had asked him, making small talk as she had learned while yet in training. With any other masculine name, anyone could have easily gone with, yes, you look like a, or the name fits you. But because he had answered Dick, and because she was new to this country, the agreeable Ingrid had replied gently, kindly, your face matches your name. And the last one I'll leave you with is called Constancy. 
sacred circles, desert chambers, writing tablets, indigenous ballparks, regal rotundas, graveyard markers, foundation blocks, cannonballs, whetting tools, aqueducts, milling stones for wheat, corn, rye. Boulders sheared off to sit upright or in the process of carving out a room, plucked from the core of the earth to dangle on delicate skin. The spark of flint, quartz, silica, opal, sand, silt, cycle of rock, magma, igneous, metamorphic, sedimentary, return to magma. Aggregate mixture of crystals, fragments, soil, concretion, stratification, compound of minerals, earth, petrified matter, alluvial gravel left lying in creek beds, gone dry. Down river, swirling waters wash over granite, smoothing out rugged lines. At the dock, Small boys perfect, skipping pebbles to make concentric circles in a still pond. In generations to come, found pieces will fill small pockets. And beyond that time, with all certainty, there will always be rock. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say, Teresa, those were beautiful. I love them. Um, the ones about motherhood were very, very beautiful too. <laughs> I love those very much. Oh my gosh. Um, sorry, I just wanted to take a moment to, um, again, thank everybody for coming um, and for letting us have some literature and poetry here for you this afternoon. <laughs> um, and I, I feel like this is exactly kind of the goal for the whole project and not only just this, um, I mean, this is Taller Puerto Ricanos first, if I'm correct, their first virtual meet the author event. Um, so I'm really, really happy that you guys could all join us here. Um, and yeah, so I, I'm getting off topic, but um, I wanted to say that um, being able to um, share literature and talk about Puerto Rico in our own terms from our own lives, our own perspectives is exactly the goal of the anthology. So it's really nice. I'm glad that you guys are able to hear, um, you know, Teresa's experiences. Um, and um, yeah, I would like to introduce our, our next guest. Yeah. Yeah. Elena. Has something to say. <laughs> yes. Um, I just, I just want to, you know, announce when it when when the Koki poem is still in people's minds, and uh, before I also forget, right, in my <laughs> you know old brain, we are going to have this project by a sound artist that oh, okay. is going to run from September to December, where he is going to install these um, speakers and et cetera, et cetera, that are going to reproduce the sound of the Coqui on North Fifth Street. Oh, so be on the lookout for that. If you are in the area, stop by. Um, I'm not sure exactly um, how it all, you know, is gonna work out. You, you will hear more information. It may only happen, you know, since we want it to be as close to nature as possible, maybe in the morning and then at dusk. But uh, the idea is that, you know, that people hear it and, and write their comments and let us know what it, you know, reminds me and, and what it evocates in them. So I just wanted to mention that. So be on the look up. I think that's a fantastic um, art installation. That's a great idea because a lot of people have um, certain, like, I think people who aren't from Puerto Rico have a very strong reaction to the cocaine noise, depending on whether they like it a lot, they think it's beautiful, or they hate it. <laughs> so um, I've, I've read in the past articles about 
transfer in a Koki, they, they accidentally went to Hawaii and they're considered pest animals there because of their sound. Um, so that's a really cool idea for an art installation. Um, if we could somehow like see people's reactions to that too, that would be so cool. Um, but anyway, that's awesome. Thank you, Carmen. Um, I'm really happy and excited to announce our next guest, Anne Davila Cardinal. Um, she's a novelist and director of recruitment from Vermont College, um, Vermont College of Fine Arts, rather, so the VCFA. She also earned her MFA in writing there. Um, she comes from a long line of Puerto Rican writers, including the poets Virgilio and Jose Antonio Davila, and her cousin, award winning fiction writer Ter. Terry Davila. Mm -hmm. um, Anne lives in Vermont with her husband, Doug, and her son, and she needle felt small reading creatures and bikes four seasons a year. So go ahead, Anne, go ahead and talk about um, your interest in this project, kind of um, what you like to write about, why you were interested in this project, and how you think, how, what your opinion is of the project, and just how, how it's worked out <laughs> so far. Sure. Sure. I mean, I think uh, um, a lot of us who are writers sort of said, oh, I should, especially Puerto Rican writers, I should do an anthology to, to fundraise. And of course, including myself, didn't do it. You <laughs> did. And so that is like, you know, a huge accomplishment. Um, and I think it was because those of us on the mainland are, um, We've, it was a, a time of helplessness. I mean, I, you know, I'm not comparing it at all to what our families endured on the island, but it was definitely, um, you know, I'm sure like a bunch of you, I, I didn't know whether my family was alive for a couple of days because I couldn't reach them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there's this feeling of helplessness. So when Elena said she was working on this project, of course I jumped. Um, I was honored to be a part of it. And it's something that's always bothered me, um, especially coming from a, a literary family, is that there's not a lot of, uh, I, I, all these writers in the, on the island that I know of, the most famous writers on the island, are not who come to mind in the United States when you say Puerto Rican writer. Mm -hmm. So there's not, because the, the work is not translated, it's not available in the States in a lot of cases, um, and including my family. Um, and so, the idea of, of having a bridge and being able to, to have authors from the island and authors, you know, mainland, she has authors from all over the world um, who are Puerto Rican uh, in this anthology is really, was really appealing to me. Um, because it was, I, I began a, a, a residency in Puerto Rico uh, for Vermont College of Fine Arts for the winter. And Maria kind of killed it that winter and it sort of moved, um, but, for five years, we went down there. We did four days in Old San Juan and had visited with writers and uh, Mayra Santos Febres and uh, Yolanda Arroyo. I mean, just incredible Puerto Rican writers. And then four days in the rainforest um, and a part of El Yunque that is not touristy. Um, and so I, I became very aware of this, la this lack of, of translation and, a, and of knowledge of, of the work of the island here and New Yorkian writers, you know, there was a bunch of New Yorkian writers I admired who nobody in my family knew about there. So there, this is a, this is like, you know, part of a bridge, um, which is important to me because there's such amazing literature on the island that is not, um, you know, well known. Um, so I was very excited to be a part of it. And I got, you know, Elena sent me the pieces of it. So I read it in sort of these chunks and I was, mesmerized. I mean, I think it's just a beautiful range of writing. Um, and there's several of my friends in here and, and it's just, it was exciting to be a part of. Um, the last anthology of Puerto Rican writers I have is, uh, it's very telling about who I am. San Juan Noir. I don't know whether any of you It's oh, really my, awesome. My cousin's in that as well. And so is my, I think Mayra edited it, but it's, it's yeah. sort of dark stories based around San Juan by Puerto Rican writers. And so it was just, and I'm always looking, you know, they often ask me to write when I'm promoting my own novels, they ask me to write articles about, um, you know, great Puerto Rican ghost stories or what, and, and so many of what I know are not available in English. And so it's, it was hard to do that. Um, so anything where we have to, to, to increase the understanding of, of the island in, in, in English in this country is great. I mean, I, I welcome it. 
so it was it was really fun to do i was very honored to do it um and that's a, that's that's about it i mean i was really excited to have to have you in it um because I admit that I was a little worried in terms of like, I've always wanted to be like this person that edits stuff, you know, I always wanted to be like an editor person. And I think like anytime you edit anything, your personality is still going to come through. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm still very much that punk rock girl. I wasn't in, in high school. So there's this element um, and like Anne's work and just Anne as a person is also very sort of this like really cool academic punk rock kind of mm -hmm. vibe. So um, I wanted to have these um, pieces and like the overall, like where it kind of lulls you into a sense of security with these like beautiful words, but then it's telling you these very like either troubling things or, you know, it's, it's, it's revealing to you like something that you hadn't thought about, like the colonial history of, of Puerto Rico, which many people don't really know. And I'm still learning a lot about my own history as well. And um, that history is also unfortunately not taught to us in school. Like we have to learn that ourselves. Um, but I like the idea of also investigating the cultural monsters that Puerto Rico has. So like the Chupacabra, um, El Cuco, things like that. So the Chupacabra is definitely in here for sure. Um, it's one of those things that I love that we in our family have stories about too. Um, so <laughs> my brother's like, you know, nodding solemnly. We all know the story of the Chupacabra. Um, but I think it's important that we do have, um, that perspective because I think, um, to, we all, every culture has its own monsters. And I think that, that was really important when I edited each section into, or each, the book itself into sections where we talk about history and family and Maria, that the history of of everything kind of comes through and that includes the chupacabra and that's why i was like okay Anne has to be involved somehow <laughs> like she has this cool story about um el cuco and then she has another one coming out about ghosts on via case island which is really awesome i have a i'm just gonna promo it real quick right here category five yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no problem <laughs> um but no, I'm just really glad to have all of you as a part of this project. Oh, um, so uh, I guess we'll move into some questions. Does that seem okay, Carmen? Um, sure, I thought Anne was going to read a little bit. Oh, if, oh. if she definitely wants to, she can. I mean, if you want to read a bit from, from your introduction, absolutely. Um, okay. I, I kind of took over the conversation again. <laughs> Hey, listen, it's your book. <laughs> You're the, the reason this happened. Um, sure, I can read my, the foreword. It's it's nice and short. And, yeah, um, please do. Uh, it's Reaching for the Moon. Um, there is not a Puerto Rican on the planet who is not emotionally compromised in late September 2017. Anyone with any Boricua blood in their veins worried for a loved one on the island or felt the storm rattling around in their chest around their hearts. And then there were those on the island when she hit on September 20th, 2017, hiding in their bathrooms. I'm gonna cry. Uh, clutching familia, pets, rosaries. Too many people died, too many suffered, are still suffering. But people find a way to continue, to persist. This, the book you're reading is a result of one writer's desire to support La Isla. And as a result of her efforts, the words of 50 other Boricua writers followed. When I first read this collection, I found myself taking a wild ride on the Cordillera of Emotions. The first section gives the book a strong foundation in the island's history, our history. It's, its nature in the Song of the Coqui, in the lyrical poem by Teresa, Teresa Mendez Quigley, and the tobacco crops of its past in Silvia Ramos Cruz's piece. Its history of the colonialism of the island in poems like 1918 con conscription or the essay Puerto Rico in the late 60s. The diaspora that Victorio Reyes Asili, uh, Silvia Ramos Cruz, and so many others beautifully capture. Even the mythology of the Chupacabra, one of my favorites after El Cuco, of course. When I read the second section entitled Familia, I wondered if the writers knew my family. 
had been watching from behind the Bayahon the three in my tia Ana's yard in Bayamon. I chuckled with the poetic narrator of the reusable heart by Adriana Martinez Figueroa. Did everyone's mother use empty margarine containers to hold leftovers? Then cried as she talked of the heart as an overflowing container that has lost sense of what it originally was supposed to hold inside. I salivated that at the picadillo recipe from Von Diaz, could smell the sofrito and see my mother's pilon. I related all too well to the straightforward abuela who kept talking about the first person protagonist's weight in Dress Yourself and cheered for Leticia Rivera Davis's childhood feminist beginnings over the patriarchal, a patriarchal game of dominoes. But it's the last section, the one about Hurricane Maria, that undid me. I spent the last 10 months working on my young adult supernatural novel, Category 5, that takes place on Vieques the summer after Maria. So the subject has been on my mind daily. And when Sarah Serrano talks in her poem, Invisibility Cloak, about feeling like we are disappearing, that the government is on a mission to wipe us out, the anger rekindles. And when Francisco Cavanillas asks in his essay, who is afraid of wind and water? I imagine a whispered but unanimous response from all Boricuas, I am. But there's also hope. An artist, Angelica de Jesus, says in describing her powerful self-portrait triptych, this recovery process has seen me speechless, joyful, anxious, focused, mourning, angry, and always hope. The very fact that these diverse and incredible writers have been gathered in one collection gives me heart and hope. It shows that Boricuas come in all sizes and colors and from all over the world, as Elena translates from the Juan Antonio Correter poem. I would be Puerto Rican even if I was born on the moon. The proceeds from this book go back to the island to support the ongoing recovery effort, but there is so much more we can do, you can do. The most important part, don't forget La Isla Bonita and her people. And as Elena says in her heartfelt and powerful introduction, Palante para siempre. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. That's awesome. Thank you. So we're gonna we're gonna open it up for for Q and A. Um, Graciela, you wanna take it over? Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I do have some questions for, um, I have a few questions. Um, uh, so this is a question from me. Um, I just, I was curious for everyone, um, were these poems made specifically for the book or were they pre-made and then once you were um, called into being the, one of the authors for this book, you decided to use that poem. Um, this is for uh, everyone. There's... Okay. Um, and Alexa also. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I think <laughs> as far as I know, uh, many of them were already had pre previously published, um, but I believe, Teresa, were yours? These were poems that hadn't been published before, correct? Um, correct, that not published, but they were written before. Um, oh. And then when I saw that call for poets uh, with our Puerto Rican voices, it was like, I can find a home for them, hopefully, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. And you throw them out into the world and you, it's like dating, you call me back, please. Yeah. Um, and so it was, it was, um, it was a place where I could find, like, put them there. I have been, like, the coqui came to me because it's something that you hear in Puerto Rico. You can't not, not hear it, right? You just hear it. Um, and it was, re having read the um, 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird, I thought, oh, okay, maybe I can do that kind of twist it, but it didn't come together exactly, right? So I had to really work on it, and I, and I, had a um, uh, critique by Christopher Burst's workshop um, for poets. 
Um, and so he's in Bucks County Community College and runs a, a workshop for adult poets. And, um, and so got critiqued. And then I sat with it for a while and just realized that it needed to be its own poem. And reading it again, I can see some undertones that can link to Pablo Neruda's work. So I feel like I didn't catch that when I was writing it in context, <laughs> but that, you know, that, that subtle message, uh, political message is there. I just saw that. That's awesome. We do have a poem in the anthology, um, speaking to 13 ways of looking at the blackbird. We have one called 13 ways of looking at rice, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was very interesting. Um, I think the majority of our, the submissions we received were poetry, um, which made it really difficult when it came down to selecting which ones would go in the anthology. Um, but yeah, as far as I know, everybody just kind of sent me stuff that they thought would be on a theme. And um, we had we had a few things from, you know, established people, right? Um, and then some of the people in this, it's their first publication ever. So we have a nice broad, uh, a nice broad, <laughs> I can't think of what I'm supposed to say. We have a nice collection here of everybody from different walks of life in terms of their career. Were there any other questions that you had, Graciela? Uh, yeah, there, I have a few more. Um, this is from Tristan. I hope I am saying the right name right. Um, when did it publish? I don't know if someone already said that before, but. Oh, um, I, I had messaged him uh, back, or them back, I'm sorry, Tristan. Um, we originally published it December 23rd of 2019. So it came out right before Christmas time. Um, and I was pretty thrilled about that because <laughs> I was like, I have to get it published in 2019. I'm not, I'm not bumping it back to 2020. Like it has to come out now. So um, yeah, it came out the 23rd, which I believe is my cousin's birthday. So um, it was a nice way to kind of like, <laughs> my brother's laughing at me. It was a nice way to uh, just make it linked where people could see it because it was Christmas time and it's like, hey, like it won't ship until January. It's a good Dia de um, Los Reyes gift, <laughs> but it came out at the end of December. Um, so uh, someone commented that they love the book cover art. Um, can you please speak more about it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh. Um, yeah, so the cover art was um, designed by um, a friend of mine on Twitter. Her name is Jade, um, J Caitlin Jade Halavati. I can put her info in the in the description in the chat if you want to um, reach out to her for anything. I don't know if her commissions are open, but you can always ask. Um, she's a great overall great person and a great person to work with. Um, she's an artist that's based out of Indiana right now currently. Um, but she's from Florida recently. Um, let's see here. So I asked her, you know, I want the three different phases of the moon. I think that that would look really nice um, because I wanted each phase of the moon to represent a different section in the book. So um, I felt like history would be like sort of a half moon because um, you're not quite fulfilled by history, right? And then family was the full moon because I felt that family was the most fulfilling. And then a crescent moon for Maria because it's kind of the most um, darkest part of the book, but it also has that hint of hope at the end. So there was some sort of, you know, um, authorial, like, I was like, yes, I want these to look a specific way. Um, let me type her name into the chat here. Um, and her, she is at Glade Jade on Twitter. So she's really nice. Um, I'd highly recommend she does business cards and things like that. So um, if you're interested in reaching out to her, you can. Um, I'll let her know that maybe people will reach out to her. <laughs> um, and she also did the artwork of the Piraguero on our Facebook page. And she, did, yeah, me too. I want a print of that. <laughs> I know. Yeah, um, I can talk to her and see if I can get you a print of it, actually. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can see it very well, but the little um, coquille, she also did that. Um, I wanted to have the coquille as the little symbol at the bottom of each page. 
because he's so emblematic of Puerto Rico. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, by the way, my name is Graciela Vasquez. I am the shop manager. Um, I have attached the link to the book to purchase. It's only ten dollars, and the fund goes straight. Yeah, five dollars. Um, the fund. Um, also, I'm sorry about the noise. I'm visiting my mother. And <laughs> no problem. <laughs> my tia is here. <laughs> they're like gossiping, catching up, but um, um, they're looking at me working at a bar and admiring it. So, <laughs> um, my other, there's another question. This is for Teresa. Um, when you were do doing the poem based on the draft, um, I forgot the name of it, I'm sorry, um, but it was um, a name after an author. Do you remember which one? Sorry, I, th I didn't quite hear the full question. Um, so the, the, the poem of, of, I think, an uncle being drafted, was that based on someone like your actual uncle? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, it was when my my father was many, many decades older than me. So um, he talked about how when he was young in Puerto Rico, um, his brother, actually, this is a story that um, his brother went into town to buy some supplies and then disappeared. And every day his mom would cry out, I Juanito, Juanito, where are you, right? And that's why in the poem it says every name she cried, every morning, she, every day she cried out your name. Um, and nobody knew because there was no communication um, between the main town and where they lived up in the montañas. And so a year later he came home and then told the story of being arrested for not having um, signed up for the draft, basically. And so um, that's a story that stayed with me. And many years later, um, I was doing some family history research, and I actually found that document where he en had to enlist, and it was marked with a little X because he didn't have a signature um, to put on that um, registration card for in, back in 1918. Okay. All right. That was a, that was a question that I had. So thank you for answering that. Um, this is for Anne. Um, why do you think there are so few translated work? So there's so many bilingual P Puerto Ricans. Why do you think there's a few translated work? It, it's an excellent question and something that um, has frustrated me. And I, as part of the residency, I, my friend Rigoberto Gonzalez, who is a Mexican, was down with there with me. And he's like, why are, isn't this being translated? Because we were exposed to all this amazing writing. I think there's not, there hasn't been enough of a call for it. And um, that needs to change. And uh, I also... I mean, and it's so much a part of the history, the stuff that isn't being translated is, is sort of the older material. But even my cousin Tere, who, is, who went to Harvard and is completely fluent in English, um, is hesitant to translate even her own work because she, she's, I, I couldn't believe it when she told me that. She goes, I'm very nervous about it. I'm, I'm gonna make mistakes. I said, you are absolutely completely bilingual. And she just felt, um, uncomfortable about it. So she, her work is being translated by a translator at University of Iowa right now. Um, and it's spectacular. I'm very excited about it. But I would love somebody to do some of the, the more historical. Um, I mean, s some of it is, I mean, I was thinking about, you know, that Edith Chacon novel. I, I, you know, I can't remember, but it, it, I, in, in, in Spanish, in my Puerto Rican literature class at Columbia, I studied all of these incredible writers and none of them are available in English. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I don't know, I, I would love to, you know, I have the fantasy about starting an imprint at a publisher and translating. 
um, but and hiring translators and doing all the whole body of this work. But I, you know, I have a full time job and, and a writing career, and it's been so crazy. But it is something I fantasize about. If I come, you know, if Hollywood calls tomorrow and I end up with a lot of money, maybe I'll do that. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I think to speak to that, um, one of my favorite authors and one of my favorite Puerto Rican authors is Rosario Ferre. And you know, yeah, it's and I, The House on the Lagoon is a beautiful book and everyone should read it, but it's often out of print. It's hard to find. If you look it up on Amazon, it's like $30 for a paperback. It's really inaccessible. Um, and some of her short stories too are fantastic, but they're not collected in anthologies or anywhere. So yeah. the I think doll one. the doll one is terrifying, <laughs> but I love well, it. Yes. The thing that's interesting about, I think she wrote House of on the Lagoon in, in English. If I'm not, I might be wrong. Um, Cause she wrote, she wrote in both, but she, uh, that one is very interesting because it has the political battle. You know, it has the independentistas and the, you know, it has so much, because politics, as we all know, is a, is the national sport of Puerto Rico. Yeah. And so it sort of gets into that. Um, and I thought it was, it's a brilliant novel. Mm -hmm. Absolutely gorgeous. I'm going to type it in the chat so everyone can, just in case. <laughs> I, I mean, I'd like to, I'd like to, to also, you know, throw it. I mean, you know, <laughs> Politics is the natural, the national sports of Puerto Rico, but politics is so enmeshed into everything that happens in Puerto Rico. And somebody made a, a comment, um, you know, um, on, on the chat, um, because, you know, what is it? I mean, I, I know for a fact that some artists, some writers feel like um, they don't really want to write in English because their primary language and it's, it's a form of saying you know you need to come and know me where i'm where i'm at right mm -hmm. so you know so there's there's that there's the you know artistic integrity that some that some artists feel and the writing in spanish is part of the of the resistance that mm -hmm. that the country has had to have in order to protect itself against you know this colonial power that has been uh, over it for for so many years so there's a lot of complicated you know, undertones uh, that, that impact the decisions of artists as well as the fact that, you know, because of the situation of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico is, is very much unknown to a large majority of the, of the people in this country. They don't know the history. They don't know the, the colonial situation that they completely, um, you know, it's, you know, it's just not in anybody's uh, environment and, 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 you know, mental, reality so that's so why I want to explain some of that yeah yeah I mean but that's why I think they they should be translated because I you know we want people to know more about it I, a lot of my friends who are on the island are trans are, are published out of um South America a lot in Spanish so it stays it does that some in Spain but but not a lot in the states and and you're right I'm sure and also it's it's just a more beautiful language to write in I mean I'm you know um, but, and I agree, it is a statement, but it's also like to open up, to, to open up awareness, I would, you know, there are some things I would love to be translated, but. Um, Leslie Portela had a, had a comment that she'd like to talk about. Hey, hi, just as writing as a New York Rican writer, I really feel Anna on you on this, like, I understand the, the, the protests on the, on the Isla, not to give into anything of the United States, trust me, if I could, I would only speak my indigenous language, <laughs> the way I feel about the United States, but that's not the reality. And I am not, like, I grew up in New York and my mother was born here, so my mother was fluent and my father was fluent in both languages, he was born in Puerto Rico, but they, I mean, when I was little, I spoke both, but now, as it, it's only living in Miami that my Spanish has gotten good. So it's like there's so many Boricuas that could really benefit that don't know their history because it's not taught to you. You have to go to college to learn anything about Puerto Rico. The average New Rican, Puerto Rican that goes to the parade and waves it knows nothing about Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. So if you can push them, if you want me to bully them, I will on Twitter. <laughs> publish, publish. Please yeah. translate. I would love to read this work. Please. Thank yeah. you. I totally agree. Yeah, I, I, we have to 
read it in some in some way. But I, I totally see Carmen's point too of being resistant because that is definitely a power that that they have, and it would be difficult to, you know, kind of. And of course, Spanish is the language of another oppressor. You know, so it's like, where do you draw the line? Like, <laughs> um, Leslie, it's like you know, Taino is is unless you're going to talk Arawak, you're you're it's an oppressive, it's a language of the oppressor. So That's it's like, I prefer. If you if I knew how to write in that, I would I would talk in that, and I would write in that. But yeah. <laughs> oh, and and I mean, I'm 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 just talking about you know the the realities of, of Puerto Rico, but I also think that you know, because there's so many, you know, Puerto Ricans now in the diaspora, those bridges is, is this book and, and your, you know, and in your, in your introduction and, and, you know, and the work that we are all trying to do to establish additional bridges and communication, you know, hopefully, you know, some of that is going to start happening as a result and a, you know, yeah. and a ripple effect of I hope so. This work. A lot of Boricuas in Florida. The census is going to show exactly how much, how many Boricuas. I suspect that there's probably more Boricuas in Florida. Not so many in Miami. I get very excited when I see any Boricuas in Orlando, but in that part of Florida, <laughs> there's a lot. So you're going to see, like, maybe that, maybe Miami is such a Spanish speaking. Maybe that's the key, you know, Florida. Maybe that's the key to draw us all together and agree to do, to educate our, our people in the mainland. Yeah. And as a mother, uh, I'm out in the Midwest. You guys are my only lifeline. Um, <laughs> and we want to raise the next generation. And so if you want to raise the next generation, language is ultimately a communication tool, no matter its origin. I mean, English itself is an amalgam of multiple languages, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. So whether or not it's a, a resistance, what we want to do is reach out and educate. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think I talked about this a little bit in the introduction, but the notion of like feeling you're not Puerto Rican enough or you're not Latino enough. And like, I know my my brother and I um, have definitely struggled with that because we both look so different. Um, you know, I mean, people have, we've both been in similar places and people have been like, oh, oh yeah, you're Latino. I see that. But then, you know, he's fair haired and like blonde hair, blue eyed. And they're like, he's not Latino. <laughs> Um, but like, it's this notion of like, we are this, we can't control what we are, right? Um, and like, learning Spanish has been difficult or not difficult, depending on like, how you approach it, right? Um, being surrounded by it in Puerto Rico when I went all the time, or when I went, being surrounded by it all the time when I went to Puerto Rico to visit my family, I was like, wow, I can speak Spanish, you know, like, awesome. I can actually do it. And then when I came back home, I was like, oh my God, I forgot like more than half of it. You know what I mean? So I definitely think it is a sense of community and like I, I wanted, I hope, and like, I'm so glad that all the people here are like, um, like Tristan said with, with hey, you're my lifeline. Like it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, like there might not be a whole lot of people, you know, um, there is a Latino population in Toledo where I'm from, but most of them are, um, you know, from Mexico or have Mexican descent. Um, and there are a few scattered Puerto Rican people there. Of course, we only meet them playing baseball or sports or things like that. So it's nice to be able to like, you know, have technology and talk to people. Um, but I do think one of those roadblocks sometimes is Spanish and it's a generational thing because, you know, you can get either teased for speaking Spanglish or you can be praised on your Spanish or praised on your English. It's kind of like a double-edged sword. So yeah. I went a little bit there. I, I live in Vermont, honey. I got you beat on the <laughs> lack of Puerto Ricans. Um, it's <laughs> Luis Guzman. Yeah. Who lives up here. But um, <laughs> just you and Luis. <laughs> <laughs> Luis Guzman and my siblings. But um, yeah, no, I get... Um, People, I've, you know, I have two responses when they say, you know, funny, you don't look Puerto Rican. Yeah. Uh, my polite response is, um, well, you know, we come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. The other response is, funny, you don't look like a bigot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, especially because of that, if she's 100%. Yeah. She's 100% Puerto Rican. She's blonde and, and fairer skinned than I am. And she often, she was in the elevator and these two boys in, in New York City were talking smack about her in Spanish. And she said, what makes you think 
I don't understand what you're saying. And they were like, well, the Blanquita, and they were like, what are you, you know, but it's something we, we sort of deal with. But like any culture, there's, there's so many variations. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I look at Zoom and I think, mommy? I mean, I see myself and I'm like, oh my God, I'm my mother. But everybody <laughs> else thinks of me as, you know, far from Puerto Rican, so I don't know. <laughs> it looks like there's some awesome um, recommendations for reading in the chat, which is sweet. Um, yeah. um, I, I, have, I, I have one last question. Um, and that wraps up for like um, the questions that I have. Um, and I think it's like a really important question. I'm sorry to, to interrupt. No. But um, with so many Puerto Ricans that are not on the island, how does being displaced affect the tone of the work? Um, that's a good question. I think, um, I think that's why I had to kind of um, separate them into sections. Uh, the, the work, because I think a lot of it, because um, as the submissions came in, I was like, okay, they're all, the, most of them are touching on the island's history, the, our familial, our, the importance of familial pride, familial connections, and then, of course, Maria, um, and many of the ones who are writing about Maria were, you know, people who had either been displaced by the storm, or people who had come back, or people who were kind of watching helplessly from the mainland. Um, so I think in terms of tone, the last half of the anthology is more, you know, kind of somber in that in that way. Um, and I knew it was going to be, right? Anything about Maria is going to really, you know, tug at my heartstrings for sure. Um, but I didn't want the whole book just to be about the pain of, of the hurricane, right? So that's kind of why I was like, okay, we'll have um, because there's so much that was going on when people were talking about it on the news, et cetera, that it's like, okay, um, it's important that we know the history too of, of the island and, and why certain problems that kind of aren't really explainable on the surface have an explanation when you look at like the history of the island. So like, why no, like, why is it difficult to get all of this medical aid or medical supplies to the island? Well, that kind of is tied into the history. Um, so I think that's kind of what I was looking for in terms of tone, where it was like, I wanted it to be serious. I wanted things to also include, like to have personality. I didn't want it to be like extremely, um, what's the word? Extremely polite or extremely um, verbose. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I didn't want it to be, I didn't want it to have language that was inaccessible to anyone, right? Um, but I also wanted it to be told from like a real perspective and like everything in here, I definitely consider to be incredible stellar writing. You know, there's nothing in here that I, that I consider, you know, like eh, that one's not so good. Like, of course not. Everything in here is, is wonderful. Um, I think it was just a matter of trying to figure out where do I put the recipes in this section? <laughs> how does, how does the story about food fit in with the overall theme of, of Puerto Rico? how does Maria fit into the overall theme of what I want to do? So I hope that um, answers your question. I guess, I guess we'll, we'll ask uh, for anybody, you know, um, having a last um, minute comment. Um, you know, let us, let us know if you want to, you know, make a final comment about the session or the book. Um, I, I, want, I do want to say something. I mean, somebody, um, you know, just pointed out, you know, understanding the dynamics of the two languages, you know, maybe we should do, you know, bilingual programming. And, you know, we, we try to do, it's not very easy to do um, because either people are dominantly one language or the other. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we try to, you know, focus on one language, you know, and not the other. But even, for example, um, to have the ability to um, uh, to print, uh, you know, our invitations and our programs and our schedules in two languages, it's always additional work. It's additional space. 
we always struggle with how much of a translation we can do in order to provide at least enough understanding in the other language that somebody that doesn't speak English can understand. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, it, it adds an additional layer of, um, of complication uh, to, you know, to, to try to be fair to, to both situations. Um, yeah, so anybody, any last minute thoughts or, Angela, you're too quiet. Uh, <laughs> uh, so my, my, my friend from Seattle is joining us and, um, you know, she's uh, somebody with quite a lot of thinking Opinion. <laughs> and opinions. <laughs> I, th I think that somebody pointed in the chat that uh, these kinds of conversations are very needed and I'm very thankful that Tajer chose to do this online and maybe this is one of the unexpected gifts of the lockout that, <laughs> that we are forced into this format and I could see people from all over the place speaking and I'm in Seattle and looking at a young woman who is in Bowling Green where I spent two years, not the happiest ones of my life. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, but I mean, <laughs> I kind of understand. <laughs> this was wonderful. I hope you will repeat it. Thank you. Uh, uh, people have asked me if I'll do another one, and I said I would, but maybe with a little more money <laughs> so that I could get it out faster and, and um, to more places. And if someone in the chat mentioned that I should um, send it to Lynn manuel Miranda, and I'm definitely going to try. I have the address that his dad posted on Twitter, so um, when I get enough courage, I will send one to him and we'll see what happens. <laughs> so just to close, uh, thank you, Elena. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Teresa. And yeah. thank you for all of the contributing authors that have either joined us uh, today or, or that have contributed to the book. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, as, as, as we are noticing, right, this is part of the silver lining of, um, of, of this situation is that we are gaining the, you know, the, the skills and the ability and the, and the practice of, you know, of connecting us and, and through here, we can connect all over, all over the place. So we'll, you know, we'll keep doing it and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> thank I'm, you all for joining us. Absolutely. Sure. And I just want to say thank you again to Tayer Puerto Rican for inviting me. It's a shame I'm not actually in Philly with you guys right now, but I'm still grateful for this opportunity. And I thank you guys so much. Um, I also want to shout out to um, Beatrice Fernandez and Leslie Portela and Carmen Milagros Torres who are with us today. Beatrice and Leslie are both contributors and so it's awesome to get to kind of sort of meet them and Carmen Milagros Torres has been so supportive of this project from the beginning so thank you so much Carmen. Um, she's actually teaching it in one of her classes um, at um, UPR so that's fantastic. I could not have asked for something more um, important and, and cool. <laughs> and additionally, um, one of our contributors, Adriana Martinez Figueroa, she um, put the book in as an ebook. She had it put in at the Iowa Writers Library or the Iowa University Library um, as a way that they can check it out as an ebook. So that's so cool. <laughs> um, but yes, thanks again, everyone, for who showed up, who's here. Um, I'm just really glad that I can continue talking about this two years after I first thought of the idea. So I'm just really excited that everyone is still very interested in this project. Um, for every book that you purchase to, $5 will go to the, um, the relief. And the way that I do that is I have a PayPal account set up in the book's name. And um, it will be, I divvy up the proceeds to different organizations in Puerto Rico. So, so far we've donated to Taya um, Salud in Puerto Rico and the Sato Project in Puerto Rico and um, the Puerto Rico Project as well. So I'm trying to focus on um, businesses and, and nonprofits that, you know, directly support the island um, or are based on the island themselves. So, yeah, your, your, your purchase is definitely going to help people for sure. So. Yay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It was nice to meet you. Estrella, did you have something last minute to say? 
Um, I'm just reminding everyone that I put the link in the chat. Please purchase the book. It's only ten dollars plus. Shit. We'll probably take around um, after two weeks of the purchase um, or so. Um, once you have um, your your item is being shipped, I will send an email with a tracking number. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you so much. Elena and, and I feel like Teresa hasn't been talking much. Um, if she's still here, um, thank you so much for making this Zoom meeting um, successful. Um, yeah, I'm really happy how it turned out. Um, thank you so much. It would have been great to do it in person, but with the circumstances, I'm really happy how this turned out. Thank you, everyone, for coming and have a good day. Yeah. Have a great night. Good weekend, Thank you. everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>